people are coming back in. Um, this is going to be a talk on SRE, Managed Services, and the Path to the Future. And my name is Sasha, and I work for Red Hat. So by way of introduction, oops. Um, I've been in this industry for a long time, and I started off as a developer. I have a computer science degree, and then I went and had all sorts of different jobs in technology, which most of them didn't exist when I was a kid, so you couldn't even choose it as a career path. Um, by and large, I like solving problems with people and technology, and I like to believe that the world is getting better every day, and that we are in a good industry to help it get better. And so that's why I'm excited to be at this conference today and be talking to you all and maybe we'll come up with new ideas. That's why I'm excited to be at this conference today. Cool. <laughs> and be talking to you all and maybe we'll come up with new ideas. That's why I'm excited to be at this conference today. Cool. <laughs> and be talking to you all and are we going to fix that? <laughs> Okay, hopefully it doesn't happen again. Okay, so anyway, awkward. Um, I'm gonna be quoting this book a lot. Um, this is a book on site reliability engineering, uh, the first one by Google, co-authored by a whole bunch of awesome people. I really like the book, it's a really good book to get started if you're just getting into SRE concepts and you want to understand what they're all about. Um, but I'm gonna start with the sentence that I least like in the whole book. And that sentence is, SRE is what happens when you ask a software engineer to design an operations team. And like, I really, really don't like this. This is usually my face when I see a definition like this um, because I think it's very elitist and it assumes that developers are cooler than ops people and that ops people couldn't come up with the idea of automation and you know, Google had to come in and solve all the world's problems. Um, it really kind of isn't what happened. The definition that I do like is that SRE is roughly Google's implementation of DevOps. Um, that definition is actually also in the SRE book, so I didn't make that one up. Um, so we started off with DevOps more than a decade ago. Um, this happens to be the picture of uh, the first two years of DevOps in Chicago. Um, and I'm the only person um, in this picture of organizers that identified as a developer. Uh, most of the other people identified as ops people. And all they really, really wanted to do is automate themselves out of a job. And we've been running this conference for a while discussing certain type of ideas um, there was an awesome person, and she's right here, and uh, wave at me, um, Bridget, and she helped grow this conference to like a global enterprise, which like thousands of people in hundreds of cities show up to. Um, and again, we were all talking about automation, um, and you know, how do we get to a better place where we get to solve more interesting problems? Um, it's not that easy to get to the future. So if you were alive in the 90s and you remember what they looked like, um, you know, that getting a new server up, if you're lucky, it took you three months, right, because you had to actually file a procurement order and you had to wait for the actual physical server to show up and then you had to build a server rack and you had to wire it up and configure it and install stuff and whatever. Also in the 90s, this was very common. Unfortunately, it still happens today, right? System downtime for two days because we are upgrading and deploying a new code version. How many nines is that? Does anybody know? So if, if you had a couple of maintenance windows like that, that would be less than uh, two nines because two nines only gives you 3.65 days a year um, of downtime. So that's just plain maintenance, right? And we took down servers for planned maintenance for whole weekends. Um, and we used to think that speed and reliability are not on the same. That's just plain maintenance, right? And we took down servers for planned maintenance for a whole weekend. I'm loving this. Um, um, and we, 
we used to think that speed and reliability can't be friends and dev and ops can't be friends because devs just are incentivized to push to production as quickly as possible and that breaks things. And ops are incentivized to keep the lights on and they carry pagers and they get paged in the middle of the night and they hate change, right? It's all about incentives. Um, but the allegory that works better for software development is actually, it's like riding a bike, right? Like what our, our um, inherent assumption is that if we go slower, we break things less, but it's actually not always true, not in all domains. And software development is kind of like riding a bicycle. If you go too slow, it actually breaks more. You can't keep your balance. So if that is the case, right, then why was there such a problem automating things? Like we, if, if going faster is actually better for everybody. Well, the biggest thing was that effective automation requires consistent APIs. Um, and that's something we didn't have. So like one of the words that pops up a lot in this talk is APIs. Um, and you need them to be able to automate anything. Clayton just talked about like, you know, the bigger control plane and being able to automate something at a across clouds level, right? But we started off at the basic level, so we, you had to start with operating system level API. And then with Linux, it was lucky because it's a file-based system, so you can write, write a script and automate things. But with Windows, it was an executable-based system, and so you depended on people having an actual API for the stuff that you wanted to automate. And guess what? People didn't have an automate, the API for the stuff you wanted to automate. And it was actually 41% of the market, server market in 2000s. So like it was a real problem that people were trying to solve. Which actually brings me to one of my favorite transformation stories, which is a story about PowerShell, championed by Jeffrey Snover. Um, and that's a CLI a scripting language and a configuration management framework that shipped in, with Windows in 2006. And before that, Jeffrey went through five years in his career where he was on the verge of getting fired every day because angry executives were yelling at him, what part of effing Windows do you not understand? Admins don't want APIs. Um, turns out that admins do want CLIs and APIs and want to automate things. And fortunately, automation won in this battle. Um, every wave of automation enables the next wave of automation, right? Next, we got to infrastructure level APIs. So this is another quote from the SRE book. Central to Borg's success and its conception was the notion of turning cluster management into an entity for which API calls could be issued, right? So basically we arrived at the idea that we needed an API for the entire infrastructure and it had to be consistent and it had to be managed and manageable by automation, automatable. And it wasn't just Google, obviously it was Amazon, it was Azure, right? Everybody was kind of arriving at the idea uh, that there was this pressure to deliver adaptable services at scale and you needed API to do that. Um, there was another thing that was happening in kind of a slightly different part of the industry, which was like if you didn't, if you weren't Google or Microsoft and if you didn't run like gazillion servers and could custom order the server X the way you wanted them. Um, you still need automation. And so companies like Puppet and Chef and Ansible were starting to build that automation for sort of your own data center, right? What wasn't there, what's new is service level objective and that is business approved availability. So there's this concept that 100% reliability is actually unsustainable, unnecessary, and also extremely expensive. Right, so if we even talk about not 100%, but the five nines, which is everybody's holy grail, right? That's five minutes, 26 seconds a year of downtime, available downtime. That's all you can have with five nines. And the major question is, will your users even know that you're that available? And the resounding answer to that is, no, they will not. <laughs> because the internet service provider's base error rate is up to 1%, which is like, you can be available four nines and then the rest of it will just drown in the network errors of the, of the ISP provider. So you're essentially spending lots of money and effort trying to attain something that's not actually useful to anybody. 
So SLOs are about aligning incentives between business and engineering, right? getting people to talk to one another. Getting business to agree at 100% availability is not something we're actually going for. And then with SLO comes the concept of error budgets, and that's acceptable level of unreliability. So the error budget is your one minus the SLO. So like if you had four nines, right, that would give you 0.01%. Uh, which would give you 13 minutes a quarter. 13 minutes a quarter is not a lot of downtime, but it's a lot more than five minutes a year, right? And that gives you some ability, some breathing room for the stuff that you can do, for the time that you can be down. And so air budgets are actually about aligning incentives between dev and ops. Because if developers are measured on the same SLO that operations people are measured on, then imagine that I have that 13 minutes a quarter, right, and I'm pushing code, and I'm writing new code, and I'm making changes, right, and then it gets, gets to the point where, where we're like at 10 minutes out of 13, right, so I have three minutes of downtime left because we had some outages because we pushed new changes, and I want my next promotion, so I want to push that big, big change at the end of the quarter, right, so I can get a promotion at the end of the year, and so my best interest is to test the hell out of it before I push the ops people to, ch to push it, right? Because I only have that three minutes left in my budget, in my error budget for the quarter. So um, SLOs and error budget actually help us align speed and reliability, right? In a way that um, makes everybody be more successful. So I'm not gonna dive into any of that, but other things that are important to um, SREs monitoring, right? If you don't know that your service is up or down, then none of this matters because you can't actually measure how many nights you, you were talking about or anything. Um, of course, observability is another concept that's related and that, again, talks about how much you know about how your services are doing. Um, this is important to me and I know some other people who, you know, carried a pager in their life. Um, you need a good signal to noise ratio because if you're paging people about every single thing that's not important, they're gonna stop responding to pages. And if you're not paging people when their help is actually required, that's also a problem. Um, we could also dive in into who should carry a pager, but we won't. <laughs> anyway, um, I do want to say, like, so it always sounds like when you talk about SRE and automation, it always sounds like automation is going to solve all everybody's problems. Um, so there is a little bit of caution in here. Automation can also be dangerous. Like, it's a really good way to make errors rapidly and at scale. You can take down the entire AWS infrastructure with one failed line of script. Um, then the second part of it is that automation drift starts immediately. So you write a service, you write automation for the service, and then you update the service, then you have to update automation, right? So you immediately start accumulating those uh, differences between the automation and the actual services it runs. Um, automating one of is inefficient. I could spend six hours automating a task that actually takes me six minutes to do manually, and if that was a one-off and it's never gonna happen again, then I just wasted time. Um, and then, importantly, very importantly, all systems are socio-technical, right? So the goal of this is never to automate humans completely out of a system. I mean, we, we make this error all the time. We're like, oh, we're gonna automate all the things because humans are the problem. Um, I mean, humans are the problem a lot of times, but also they are the solution, right? Because um, the second law of thermodynamics states that um, universe goes towards chaos, right? So all systems left um, unsupervised uh, tend toward chaos and entropy always wins in the end. So you need a human to maintain order. So let's talk about what the future is. And uh, Clayton said that he doesn't know what the future is. I do, so. <laughs> It's not, no, but I think there's a certain kind of level of goals that we all have, right? We, we kind of are striving towards the same thing. Um, the, the future 
is already here. It's just not all evenly distributed. So I know if we talk about like the five nines and all the fancy automation things, there are companies that are running at close to five nines and there are companies that are like, well, I had to take my service down for two days just to update because, you know, we had a merge hell and we don't actually test anything before it gets to production and stuff. And that's what people live with. People also have like 70 years of what we call legacy code and that's the actual thing that makes them money and they have to run a business, you know. Um, so I think, and I'm biased because I work for Red Hat and I, and I you know, I'm on a managed services team, right? So I think the future is in managed services. Um, and managed services can be defined in, in, in you know, many ways, right? But um, it's all about platform as a service, right? We've, we've been talking about platform as a service for a really long time, right? And we've wanted platform as a service for 10 years or probably 20, right? And we just, all we want is to get to the point where we can run our applications. Um, and there were many attempts to implement a PaaS service, right? Some of them were more successful or less successful. Um, problem is that PaaS really works as long as your environment is homogenous and no one's environment is homogenous. If you have a big enough company, you don't have a homogenous environment, right? You're probably running on three clouds, a data center, and then, I don't know, some, some spreadsheet somewhere runs on Excel on someone's laptop. Like, it just happens. And we know that effective automation requires consistent APIs. And we know that every wave of automation enables the next wave of automation, which is why I'm happy that I'm a KubeCon, because I think that Kubernetes is potentially something that will allow us to proceed to the future and have that consistency and have that consistent API across different systems and different deployments. Um, so 85% of global IT leaders agree that Kubernetes is the key to cloud native application strategies. I don't know if all application strategies, but you know, cloud native application strategies. Um, so point is everybody wants to have a piece of Kubernetes, um, which is cool. Um, and the other thing is like, we, we all have open source now, which provides a, like open source one, um, and it provides us with a way of setting up a standard and letting people do kind of share knowledge, what we have in common and work together to define what that consistent API looks like. But the problem with open source, and yes, I think probably everyone's gonna have this slide in their presentation, the problem with open source um, is that, you know, you, you have the proliferation of services and tools and all the things, um, and that's a real, world picture of someone trying to run Kubernetes in production. <laughs> so that's what it usually ends um, like, and, but you do have an advantage today compared to just a few years ago. Like if you want to get out of the data center management business, you can go to the cloud. And if you want to get out of Kubernetes management business, you can go to OpenShift. Again, like I said, I'm biased, right? So on, on this team, that works on these services that are called Red Hat Cloud Services, right? And, and we run on top of different clouds. Actually, you can pick your favorite cloud and run your managed OpenShift on one of those clouds. Um, and OpenShift is kind of an opinionated, turnkey way to get all the bells and whistles that you need inside your Kubernetes so you don't have to browse that CNCF slide and identify whose project is maintained by a single maintainer on weekends um, and you're now depending with all your security on something that Joe is maintaining his garage when he has free time. Um, and there's the whole thing which like we do actually as, um, run SRE for the folks um, who rely on these Red Hat cloud services um, on top of different clouds, which is an interesting problem to solve because we don't own the infrastructure, right? And we are running SRE on top of infrastructure we don't own, which is exactly the same problem every company in the world who's not Google, Microsoft, or Amazon is trying to solve. So we're trying to solve it for other people, which is cool. Um, you know, at Red Hat so we also went through a journey. Um, so when we first started offering these services, it was a you know, SLA of two nines, and now it's four, and we're trying to get even better and better. 
you know, because a continuous improvement is a thing. Um, so if you compare the traditional organizations with cloud native organizations in a traditional manner, again, we have this proliferation of different infrastructure and we have this proliferation of different uh, platform services, right? And again, as you standardize, you're just getting to enable people to um, automate this complexity and to standardize on something that it can all share across the board. And so eventually, what you want to get to is that infrastructure services are run by the by a cloud provider or somebody else, um, platform services are run by, by somebody else, and then you only have to work worry about the applications that you built. There's this picture, I, I like this picture. It, it comes from, like originally from Hans Moravec, um, talking about AI um, taking over the world, which probably eventually will happen, I don't know. Um, Basically, it's like a picture of this water rising in the landscape, right? And so AI gradually takes over people's jobs. Um, we're not talking about AI yet here. We're talking about automation, but it's still happening, right? The API kind of gets higher and higher. So if you are a driver, you probably want to look at different career paths because self-driving cars will eventually arrive, right? So the goal here is to keep your skills above the API and s solve actual smart problems instead of doing something that's gonna be table stakes in a few years. Um, so to the extent possible, you want to outsource your SRE to your platform provider. And um, last but not least, I wanted to mention something that um, but it's working on. Um, so first of all, ideas are open source, which is why I learned a bunch of ideas in these slides from other smart people, and hopefully other smart people learn ideas from me sometime. Um, and we know that open source won, because it's cool, but we now are facing a slightly different challenge that we did before. Um, so, you know, in, in open source, we are always trying to incorporate the knowledge that we learn back into the code base, right? So upstream first, we're trying to share. Um, but now that we're moving to everything is a SaaS, right? We're having this problem again where the platform is proprietary, right? So we're no longer sharing knowledge. We're no longer contributing the knowledge back to upstream. Um, and so Red Hat is, this is super initial stages, but we're starting this new initiative that's called Operate First. It's a concept of incorporating operational experience back into software development, right? So you can find um, some of these concepts on the website. It's um, operatefirst.cloud. Um, and there's um, an effort to basically get people started with um, a playbook for learning how to run SRE and also in a playbook for um, sharing operational knowledge across different clouds, right? So we can all learn from each other in terms of how we run these services. So that was all I wanted to share with you today. And um, I'm Sasha, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, especially follow me if you like cat videos. And I'd be, <laughs> um, I'd be happy to continue this conversation because like I said, I think we all learn from each other all the time.